of uh, the semester of the academic year here at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I'm happy to see many familiar faces and many new faces. Uh, my name is Emily Gautrich. I'm the chair of the center, and I couldn't be more delighted uh, to have uh, the guest we have with us today to open our series. Um, by the way, this uh, talk is being sponsored by the Center for the Study of Law and Society. We're very happy to have, uh, uh, I think, one of our first cooperative, cooperative acts with them, and I think the first of, of many. Um, so just very briefly, I think we're all very familiar, perhaps too familiar, uh, with the legal geography of the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, the uh, problem of the settlements, of course, in the West Bank, the near collapse or total collapse of civilian infrastructure in Gaza, the new nationality law in Israel proper. Uh, but I think in the, in the shuffle, one area, uh, one very important area, um, uh, tends to kind of get short shrift and forgotten about, and that's Bedouin territories and Bedouin uh, rights, especially land rights. Um, and water rights. And what well, well, land, right? Uh, for, the, for that reason, we're very, very pleased to have with us today Alexander, or Sammy, as he likes to be called, Heather, uh, an expert on justice topic and co-author of the just-published work, Empty Lands, the Legal Geography of Bedouin Rights in the Negev, published by Stanford University Press in 2018. And his co-author is Orgy Tachel. Okay, not a lot of um, uh, so Sandy comes to us from the law school at the University of Haifa. He holds a doctorate in law from Harvard University and has served as a visiting professor at the University of Michigan Law School. His research focuses on legal geography, legal history, law and society, and land regimes in settler societies and in Israel. I'll we'll have to ask why he makes that distinction. Uh, that for lunch. Uh, he has served as the president of the Israeli Law and Society Association and is co-founder and director of the Association for Distributive Justice and a very important Israeli NGO. Sandy is an accomplished scholar with too many publications in his name to list here. I'll just mention that he's co-author of The Expanding Spaces of Law, A Timely Legal Geography, also by Stanford University Press, in which his seminal work, Expanding Legal Geographies, A Call for a Critical Comparative Approach, appears. Uh, but today you will be talking with us about that right. So please join me in welcoming Sandy Kenner to the CMES and to see what So uh, thank you very much. I really want to thank uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, uh, Emily and uh, Mary, as well as the Center for the Study in One Society, uh, Jonathan, uh, Simon Rosan and uh, as well as Malcolm Fieldy, um, connecting things. Um, so uh, what I want to do is really to present the book, and uh, if possible, uh, I will talk. I understand I have about forty-five minutes, and uh, if you have clarification questions, please ask now. If you have more substantive comments, which I believe you probably have, because it's a very heated and disputed area, please keep it to uh, after uh, my lecture. So, what I want to do today is uh, what I want to do today is uh, first uh, to say a few words about my involvement uh, because I would say that my position in these issues is not only an academic but I also am uh, I believe that people uh, or can have involvement, but it's also a, a kind of, let's say, uh, an intellectual engagé, uh, connected. I think that this is important if you do it, but it's also very problematic in issues of discussion about objectivity or knowledge and so on. So, uh, just uh, as a disclosure, I've been active uh, in uh, helping. Uh, one of the heroes of our story, Nuri Elukbi, that goes through the whole book. It's a, he's a Bedouin activist who reached the Supreme Court in trying to uh, have his land registered under a settlement of title claim, and he failed. And I've been involved in helping him, and the book also writes about these issues. Uh, my co-author, Oren Tachel, wrote an expert opinion supporting the Bedouins, which was uh, rejected by the courts is not true, or something like that. You know, the court holds academic knowledge as well. It's 
So we have, as academics, we have the privilege of answering an Israeli Supreme Court, which is very rare to do, but I think we succeeded in doing. So I just say we are involved. Um, and on the other hand, if you are interested, um, we have a, I would say that there are two groups that are having uh, an academic and maybe a public uh, struggle. My side are mainly the three co-authors, Oren, uh, Ahmad, and myself. And the other side are uh, a group headed by a professor of uh, historical geography, uh, Emerita Professor Ruth Kark from the Hebrew University right expert opinion in favor of the state, uh, supporting the idea that Bedouins are nomads, landless, and so on. And two of her former PhD students, one of them was also uh, the attorney in charge of, uh, at the same time she was the attorney in charge of pursuing all the cases against the Bedouin in the negative court. So there is an ongoing fight, if you want, or a struggle, and then to start with, which I think is a good way because I know that every time I write something, uh, each uh, footnote will be checked. And that's, that's rare in the middle of to see the number of footnotes we have in this book. So I had two kind of uh, uh, assist, uh, two groups of uh, research assistants that other check our footnotes. Finding us falsifying falsifying uh, the footnotes. So. This is just a, a, a discourse. What I want to do is give a very short background about the Bedouins, then uh, present the books. The book then talk a bit about the land dispute and focus on what we call in the book the dead negative doctrine, which we argue is the kind of equivalent to the terra nullius doctrine that was uh, uh, spread in some sector societies. Uh, we call it the DND, and I will critique, I'll show the critique of the DND uh, analyzing, analyzing the Israel Supreme Court decision rejecting all the claims of the Bedouins, and I'll try to do all that within 45 minutes. It's difficult, we've been working on the book three persons for more than five years, so it's not easy to look at the landscape, but uh, I'll try and uh, do that. So I tried with, uh, uh, I'll begin with some kind of uh, uh, reports. Elisheva Goldberg uh, <coughs> report a visit of an unrecognized village he calls Tel El Barad during uh, the heated summer of July 2014. And she said, when uh, I visited Tel El Barad one recent afternoon, a rocket had just landed in the village livestock pen. According to government sources, the rocket had fallen in one of the country's open areas. A term Israeli officials frequently use when describing rocket attacks and one implying that the rockets drop harmlessly in empty fields. But open areas are not always empty. They also encompass many of the Bedouin villages of southern Israel. And she continues and she says, Iron Dome does not discharge in open area, and therefore there are no sirens, much less public bomb changes. For the Bedouins of southern Israel, there is nowhere to run. They find themselves both outside the protection of the Israeli state and targeted by the Hamas because they are not recognized. They are a population that has fallen through the cracks, a population protected by no one. And I think this is really the essence of the situation. And when the Israeli Association for uh, Human Rights in Israel uh, and uh, petition in the name of one of the Bedouins trying to get uh, their settlements covered, the Israel Supreme Court rejected a petition during uh, Operation, uh, what was that, Suketan, um, the last war in Gaza, uh, and it was in the midst of the war, and they asked to be covered and protected by Iron Dome, and the uh, Israel Supreme Court rejected a petition to uh, have shelters and protection, and accepted the view of the uh, state that argued that the lack of shelters and protective facilities results from illegal settlements and buildings. And actually, people were killed because one person at least was killed because of lack of protection. So it's really a question of life and death. And so when we talk about unrecognized uh, settlement settlements, in all in all, today there are about 220,000 uh, Bedouins in the Negev desert or Negev area. Uh, these are the remains of 
the Bedouins that uh, lived in, Israel, in the territory before 1948. Most of the Bedouins were expelled or the return was barred by the Israeli uh, state after 1948 and about 12 to 15,000 that were uh, deemed to be the friendly Bedouins, they were termed by a special committee, the friendly Bedouins were allowed to stay or return to Israel and since they have a very high birth rate, now they have there are about 220,000. Uh, and half of them, about half of them, live in unrecognized and illegal settlements. The rest are living in townships that uh, are not great, I can tell you that. Uh, and they are defined as trespassers, intruders, and therefore do not receive basic services such as water, electricity, health, etc. You can see electricity lines running over their settlements, but not, not connected. And there is an intensive uh, process of uh, destruction of their dwelling because all, everything is considered illegal, both because they are considered trespassers and because they don't have uh, building permits because there are no way to receive a building permit in the area. And what is also going on is that there is an ongoing process since uh, uh, last 10, 15 per, uh, years of settlement of title, which is very formalistic. So one of the things is based on, on an English uh, system, which is called the Torrance system, the settlement of title. And one of the things is that seemingly the Bedouins have their day in court, so they can try to prove their land rights, but in fact, it's a kind of dead end, because what I want to show and we show in the book is that uh, uh, they fail or they constantly fail to proving their rights. So this is a great way to uh, dispossess and deny his dispossession simultaneously. And that's what we are going to uh, show. So just an overview of what uh, 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 unrecognized uh, township looks like, the unrecognized settlement uh, looks like. It looks like very of the uh, Visions of uh, third world, uh, you know, like Cape Town and, uh, and near Buenos Aires and uh, in the Brazil. I mean, it's the same view. And what we see is that Israel is in a process of constant destruction. There has been in the last few years a, a struggle over a place called El Abakib, which is not far from Be'er Sheva. And they struggle and the state is destroying their houses. Uh, they return and they move to their cemeteries and so on, and all the time the Israel is destroying and they cling to the house. I mean, it's not houses anymore, but there is a process of destruction. Uh, and this is uh, uh, just uh, from uh, yesterday, I'll have also, uh, I didn't find so much in English, uh, but this is from actually Abu Cheba, which is a right-wing uh, news. Yesterday, the uh, district court put the, the English uh, uh, equivalent yesterday, the Israeli district court uh, rejected uh, the appeal of uh, Sheikh, uh, the sheikh of El Arakib Bedouin village, and he was sentenced to 10 months uh, prison, he's a 68 year old, for his trespassing over the land that he argued is his uh, tribe land. Actually, uh, they claim that they bought the land from the al family, okay? So and we have documents of the transactions. So the al which is a real uh, main character of our book, their tribe sold some of the land to uh, al -Turi. So al have, you know, uh, land rights, uh, and if they probably want to feed and purchase, but they're not settlers, so this doesn't, doesn't work as uh, if you saw the uh, Anyhow, I don't want to talk about it. So that's a general background. And uh, so about the book, so the book we've been working pretty hard for uh, together. Uh, and uh, I am a legal historian and legal geographer. Uh, Ahmad Amara uh, finished a PhD while working, uh, while we were working on the book, and he actually studied 
uh, Ottoman uh, law and studied Ottoman Turkish and went into Ottoman archives. And, you know, the third part of it was uh, used in the book. And Oren Ifnachel is a political uh, geographer. So it's really an interdisciplinary endeavor. Uh, a few words about the, the book. Uh, the book is based on uh, several uh, parts. The first part is introduce the story, who are Alupi, what are Bedouins, uh, what is the narrative about uh, the story. And then uh, we have an overview of the relevant uh, scholarly and legal frameworks. Uh, we talk about Bedouin Arabs uh, in the process of indigenous uh, dispossession. Generally, we talk about uh, ethnocracy, uh, we talk about Legal critical legal geography and other stuff, uh, and took it also in the context of uh, uh, the terra nullius uh, discourse and uh, colonial, settler colonial, colonial discourses, uh, and just to put it as a major framework we are working with. Then, uh, what we do is essentially we uh, analyze, and I will show later, the main components of the dead negative doctrine. And I later I will show what are the major components, but essentially what uh, the second part of the book is uh, doing a critical legal history of the dead negative doctrine. And what we do is one chapter looks at uh, the Ottoman uh, period, mostly from a legal perspective. So, uh, because one of the issues is that one central claim by Israel is that Israel is not doing anything new. It is just applying previous laws, the laws that were enforced by the Ottoman and the British. So therefore, it's not that Israel is reinventing laws in order to dispossess because it's a Jewish uh, state. It's not that. It's just as a good uh, state. It's uh, safekeeping the land that belongs to the state. Uh, so. What we do is to, we show that, uh, uh, contrary to uh, the argument of Israel, the Ottoman law was at least much more uh, flexible and open-ended than Israel presented. And therefore, uh, even if we work within the Ottoman land law, uh, Bedouin should not be considered um, trespasser. And I will say a few things about that. Then we do the same thing about the British mandate period, because uh, the British introduced some uh, changes during the mandate period between 1922 and 1947, 48, and uh, so we analyzed the legal doctrines, uh, we analyzed legal, legal cases from the British period, and also show what was the relationship, uh, the legal relationship between uh, the British mandate and the Bedouins, the legal one. And then the last uh, chapter in this part is about the construction of uh, the Negev doctrine and how it was, the, the, the doctrine and how it was constructed by Israel during the years and moving from an early position where Israel actually recognized that this is secret documents that uh, Bedouin had land rights. So I'll show you one of them, these documents uh, and into a position that. Bedouins were uh, landless, nomads, and, uh, and, and had no rights. The next uh, part is uh, we look at the geography, because one of the interesting uh, things in this doctrine is that it is a connection of law and geography. So the construction is that Bedouins are without rights because they were nomads, they were not cultivating the land, and no settlements. What we do is based on the historical geography and analysis of various documents. We show that the uh, Bedouins actually were engaged in agriculture at least since uh, the mid 19th century. Um, they were exporting even wheat and barley to Europe. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of agriculture. And also that uh, Bedouins were not just nomads scattered around, but they had clear uh, settlement patterns, although they did not fit uh, the European vision or uh, the North uh, 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 Palestinian uh, vision of a village because they lived in tents. But as we show, uh, 
the fact that people were moving, let's say, from a summer dwelling to a winter dwelling doesn't mean that these people were just on errands. And uh, the example I will say is that the same, under the same rationale, uh, our Prime Minister, Bibi Netanyahu, is also a nomad because during the week he's in Jerusalem and in the weekend he's in Syria, so we could say that he's also a nomad according to this rationale. Uh, and of course, we don't feel. Then uh, the next part uh, looks at the, the Bedouins in a comparative lens, and essentially the argument here is that the Bedouins are a, an in indigenous uh, community. And that's, uh, we do it, and it's a context, and it's, it, I'm not talking about it today uh, so much, but if you want, I can open it in a QA session. Uh, looking at uh, the current situation of who is indigenous, which is a very controversial uh, definition, uh, uh, not definition, but uh, issue, uh, we show that the current understanding of who is indigenous is, has changed tremendously in the last uh, 100 years and so on, and especially since uh, uh, the declaration of uh, the United Nations, Decla United Nations declaration of uh, indigenous people from 2007, and according to this, and after doing a serious literature uh, review and also cases, we uh, show demonstrate that the Bedouins are not less indigenous than many other indigenous people, especially uh, that you don't have to have. Um, you don't even have to have a colonial power today, or even a colonial, you, know, you don't have to be in the United States or uh, New Zealand or Australia in order to define somebody as indigenous. There are indigenous people in Asia, there are indigenous people in Africa, and so on. Even the, in some cases where the majority would say is indigenous to the country, the legal definition distinguished between uh, let's say a homeland community and an indigenous community which has to be in a certain power relationship to the, to the majority. So according to this, we argue that the Bedouins fit to the characterization of indigenous people. And then uh, the next move is uh, we look at the status of uh, indigenous people in uh, international law. And here, uh, after it's also very controversial, but we reach the conclusion that today uh, parts of uh, United Nations Declaration of uh, Indigenous People has become customary international law. Now this is very important because and especially parts that have to do with land and territorial rights and parts that have to do with the right of consultation that is almost uh, close to a veto power. Uh, about issues concerning the future of uh, indigenous people. So if this is correct, we believe it is correct. So uh, the, um, the result is that if we argue that Bedouins are indigenous people, laws, international law related to indigenous people has become, in relevant issues that have, have to do with this one, and has become customary international law. And in Israel, we adopted the British system and customary international law applies directly as part of Israeli law, unless it contravenes directly uh, a statute. So if this argument is correct, so for example, when the Supreme Court rules against the Bedouins, the way they do, I think they rule against international law, which is part of the Israeli it's not the first time, I mean, interpretation of occupied territories are pretty standard on the legal interpretation by the Israeli Supreme Court, but the argument is that, in fact, if the Israeli courts would have applied internal law, which includes international law, uh, Bedouins should at least have a completely different, uh, uh, a completely different approach by the, uh, the courts. And the last part is uh, contested futures. We review the, the state solution uh, processes and, and proposals, which has changed over the years. And then, 
the part which is arguing, and which was mainly written by Owen Tafel, arguing based on the work he's done with uh, the Bedouin communities, uh, the long work with communities, working with groups, and so on, of arguing that even with, if we don't deal with the property issue, but only if we deal with uh, the planning issue, if we apply the general planning rules uh, and laws in Israel to the Bedouin unrecognized communities, it is possible to recognize almost all current communities with some small changes. Uh, so that means we could put aside for the moment the land dispute work only in recognizing unrecognized villages and if we apply the same rules that apply to let's say uh, kibbutzim and moshavim and uh, ranches and uh, towns and all the other things that are applied to Jews in the Negev if you apply equally then uh, we could uh, recognize the Bedouins uh, townships or uh, unrecognized villages and then the conclusion and I'm going to actually to talk about the first part of the conclusion. The conclusion, the first part is an appendix because when, while we were writing the book, uh, the case was going up to the Supreme Court and when we were nearing uh, the end of the book, the Israel Supreme Court ruled uh, in the appeal of uh, Elukbi and uh, we added uh, an appendix criticizing the decision and rejected everything. In appeal. So I'm, 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 I will use later this case as an example of some of the flaws in uh, the current uh, jurisprudence. Okay, so uh, what we are talking about, uh, this is the map of Israel, the maps are all from, most of them are from the book. Uh, so we have in the center, uh, if you look here, we have what is called the Sayal area that goes from Be'er Sheva, Dimona, and Arad, uh, and a small part here in, in uh, Rad. This is the map of Israel, and this is where we are. Uh, so this is the area where most Bedouins were concentrated after 1948. I mean, they were in larger areas, but they were moved and concentrated in this area, and they could not move out from this place without any permit by the military uh, um, uh, commander that was uh, ruling them until 1966. Uh, so this is a larger view of the south uh, and uh, this is also the map of uh, the land claims. Uh, there are about uh, 3,200 land claims of uh, Bedouins in the area. Uh, and it's very interesting because when we look at the land claims, there is about less than one, about one percent of overlap between the land claims. So the Bedouins really know who owns what, and it's very strong. Okay, so these are the claims. They were registered in the 1970s, and then um, uh, Israel froze the land registration process. And, as I said, we are in the process of the courts are, the, the courts are uh, defining the Bedouin and trespasser. Israel is, has now a special police force dealing with the Bedouins, a paramilitary police force, uh, and they are destroying its, uh, even uh, in El Alaki, a person, uh, actually two persons, a, a teacher and a policeman were killed in an incident. Uh, about a year and a half ago or two years ago. Uh, so, now we get to the argument about what is the, the dead Negev doctrine. The dead Negev doctrine uh, is a, a doctrine was created by uh, Israel uh, that facilitates a settlement and non-nationalization. And as I said, it resembles the logic of Terra Nullius, and I, I assume, I don't know, I know that empty land, that's the doctrine that says, for example, that Australia was empty, and therefore when the British arrived, they had all the rights in the land. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's on a, on a very basic level. And 
what we do in the book is we show the distortion in this uh, doctrine, which is very powerful. Uh, and also we argue and we show it's very difficult, especially for people that are critical, to say this is incorrect, this is not a correct understanding of the law, because I think that law is much more flexible than it's usually uh, understood, at least by non-lawyers. Uh, but what we show is that each legal, historical, geographical, and, dis and other points, a discretion point, the choice made is to the detriment of the benefit. So, for example, if you can interpret the statute that way or that way, you'll interpret it in a way that it works against the Bedouin. I would say maybe it's a legitimate interpretation, but it's not the only one possible, but it always presented as a constraint to hear the court. We have nothing to do about it. This is the only way we can interpret. And uh, we know, uh, at least I think from our work, that indigenous dispossession always or often entails a denial of the dispossession because there is kind of conflict. You want to see yourself as a good person that you are dispossessing. And the uh, DMV is a special, special legal justificatory doctrine that, as I said before, dispossesses while human steps simultaneously denying the dispossession. And it's based on intertwined, often ambiguous, historical, legal, and geographical claims, and procedural and evidentiary legal tools, which he contests throughout the book. And like uh, I quote here a, a scholar called uh, Veracini, who wrote about uh, Terranullius, like Terranullius, by definition, the, the negative doctrine covers trucks, so it denies what it does. And uh, a key move in this uh, construction was the definition of the entire Negev region as dead land or mawat, which is a uh, legal uh, Ottoman legal cate category, which derives from the Muslim tradition and later appears in the 1858 Ottoman land code and also in British mandate legislation. So the DMD, in fact, is constantly wavering between norms and facts substance and procedure, law, history, and geography, it's very difficult to uh, grasp it. Its inherent stiltiness is an important channel by which its hegemonic power is forged. Uh, but for clarity purposes, and it took us a long time to really pin it down, we uh, distill and then refute eight core components of the DMD. Uh, and as I said, the choice is always presented as a constraint. So what we're going to do is talk about the eight main DMD components. Uh, Israel claims legal continuity with and scrupulous application of Ottoman and British land laws, particularly uh, the settlement of title legislation, uh, those regulating Mawat and other kind of uh, land, near land. But uh, what we show in uh, the book is that there is lack of continuity with Ottoman and British mandate laws and practices. So it's not continuity. There is a break done by Israel. Then uh, Israel claims that the Bedouins lack an organized functioning and property land system. And we show the existence and persistence of an elaborate, consistent, and well-functioning indigenous tribal land system very clear, as I said, for example, 1% overlap from land claims, which is nothing. Then, uh, previous regimes never recognized Bedouin legal autonomy or customary law, Israel claims. So, there is nothing. Why, why should we recognize something that was not recognized by others, by previous regimes? But what we show in the book is that there was a lack of effective Ottoman rule in the region <coughs> until, at the very least, 1901, when the city of Beersheba was established, and then legal autonomy was granted by, uh, to the Bedouins by the Ottomans, and then by the British uh, rulers. So they had a strong autonomy in their internal legal system. Uh, we show also that there was an extensive sale of Bedouin land to Jewish and Arab purchasers during the late Ottoman and particularly British times, and its successful title registration, which, and this is very important, confirmed the Bedouin's traditional system 
and the position of previous governments that they did not own the land. Let me clarify what I mean. Usually, in law, I cannot transfer more than I have. So, if a Bedouin is selling land to a Jew uh, during the Monday period, and then the British register it, it means two things. First, that they recognize that the Bedouin had their land right, and two, that they did not claim that the land belonged to the state, as Israel does today, because if they would have argued that the land belongs to the state, would have, the register with the British official would have never done it. Okay? And actually, my great uncle, uh, Moshe Smilansky, was also a, a, a famous uh, author, was working in buying land from the Bedouins, yeah. Okay, so so uh, and and the more, but this land actually served for the establishment of all the settlement in the Negev before 1948. All the kibbutzim who established them were based on acquisition of land for the Bedouins, and are all thriving and well, and nobody is denying their land rights. Uh, the Bedouin failure to register the land until a specific date. Uh, which is uh, decreed by the British Mandat, uh, British, British Mewak Land Ordinance uh, in April 16, 1921. There was a date where they were supposed to come and register their land, make them continuous trespassers. So almost a hundred years ago, if a certain date, just early, even before the formal Monday, if uh, the Bedouins in the middle of the Negev didn't come to a registrar that we didn't know about, they continue to be a trespasser forever. And we show that the British Malak ordinance were not consistently or fully applied in Palestine in general, and never in the negative for various reasons, some of them because the British granted autonomy to the Bedouins. And uh, additionally, uh, the Israeli state argues that uh, at least until 1921, Bedouin did not cultivate regularly the native land, so there are no, the land was not revived, though it was remained dead. And we show that historical geography of the Negev Bedouins in the 19th century clearly shows pervasive cultivation and Bedouin settlement, and again, it's very extensively documented in the book. And additionally, at least until 1921, the Bedouin were nomadic, lacking permanent settlement. And we show that uh, the Bedouins were not nomadic, but the complete. Uh, somebody told me he studies anthropology here. So there is a concept of semi I don't know if you learned about semi nomadic, which is very different from nomadic. It's people that are moving uh, on very clear uh, uh, patterns uh, and have a uh, relationship, very clear relationship to the land. And we show that they're not nomadic, but semi nomadic. Uh, Israel claims that Bedouins are not indigenous, actually the person, the group that is the indigenous to the land are we, the Jews, we are indigenous, the Bedouins are actually, one of the arguments of the, the Bedouins are the colonizers. One of them was made by Woodcock, but they are the real colonizers, they expelled the other Arabs, so, so, and then, of course we are the true indigenous uh, people. Uh, but uh, we show in uh, part of the book that we, uh, that the Bedouins certainly fit the characterization of indigenous people. Uh, and something that I'm very interested in, uh, in the relationship between substantive law and uh, uh, procedural and evidentiary law. Because what we, we see is that after we have uh, set all these seven components, Disprove the burden to disprove each of them uh, is on the Bedouins. So you have to prove that you cultivated the land, actually it's 1921, but 1921 is not enough. You have to prove that you did it before 1858. And I don't know if you know about the state of uh, knowledge about the negative, who cultivated what in 1858 is, is just impossible, and no area of photos. And even when people come to the camp, to the court and show, uh, for example, travelers' description talking about we, we have many of these uh, documents in the book. So the court said, "What do we know? We don't know that it was the exact track that is disputed. How do we know that it was not 50 meters 
uh, uh, longer. So of course it's it's a game. It's a, it's it's not really uh, a, a legal game. It's just you say you have to prove that you have to prove that you have to disprove the claim of, of the state. And uh, what we show is that the international, regional, and uh, national norms increasingly grant land and territorial rights to indigenous community and adapt. Uh, procedural and evidence will be more congruous with indigenous norms and practice. We saw, for example, in Canada, and uh, uh, recently a very important case uh, de delivered by the Supreme Court, uh, the Chief Justice of the Court, uh, said uh, that you cannot expect the indigenous people to behave like as if they were working with the lawyers based on the tourist system and the accept the uh, oral evidence and, and stuff like that and all that you know the court said you did not prove and that's it wash our hands and everything is good so uh, the court decisions i will run a bit uh, essentially uh, there was an early court i will not talk about it court decision in 1974 who denied all the rights of the bedouins and then we have the al ukbi case which uh, in 2014 the Israeli Supreme Court heard an appeal entered by the El Ukbi and uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, appeal challenged an earlier decision by the District Court where the Bedouins asked to register their land uh, and uh, in this case you know, it was the first attempt to really argue seriously about the land rights of the Bedouin. I must say that it started not to work very well because Nobelupi was first uh, represented by uh, a lawyer that didn't really understand much what he was doing. Uh, and then later, Oren Fratel and myself were involved in Ahmad and we succeeded in changing the lawyer to excellent lawyer was Michael Spahl, I don't know if you know him, he's really a leading Israeli lawyer, but it was already after most of the evidence was presented, I was sitting in one of the cases, it was horrible, because, uh, you know, it's really sometimes a bad lawyer can really ruin a lot, so, so there were some problems in introducing the evidence and cross-examination uh, and so on, but, uh, Anyhow, still we managed to, uh, to, to work in a certain stage where uh, I think that the case was quite strong, but uh, the district court uh, rejected everything uh, claimed by uh, the Bedouin, and then uh, it reached the Israeli Supreme Court. Now I have five minutes, so I'm trying to say. The Supreme Court decided in May 2015 uh, to dismiss the appeal and practically all the arguments, which I think is also extremely uh, problematic. You know, I come from a critical legal perspective, and you know that if you want the hegemony to work, you have to give the weak, weak uh, 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 parties some wins in order to believe the system in order to have to vote. But the Bedouins lost 100% of the cases, and in the Supreme Court decision, there was not even one word of empathy. It's, 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 it's hard. And the court, uh, the, the judge who delivered the Supreme Court, but then a, a Supreme Court judge, which is now the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, uh, and I told some people, you know, she should take our book and show it to the Minister of Justice because we criticize her as being really uh, uh, pro-state and so on. But when she was, there was talks about nominating her, she was, uh, our Minister of Justice was thinking that she was too liberal and so on anyhow. So uh, we think that uh, the court endeavors uh, to closed every possible gaps in the DNA. I mean, the court, she's a very intelligent woman, and she did a, a, a great job. I mean, you really, if you read it without having done 
they work like that. It's very persuasive. You know, she but we found a lot of omissions and you know, she reinterpreted some cases, she quotes part of uh, sentences from uh, documents and so on. But if you just read the case, you know, uh, it's, it's very strong. And so they constructed a fortified legal edifice in order to deter future Bedouin land claimants. Um, the, the court refused to reverse the DMD while further entrenching it. Uh, uh, claim it, it uh, decided that any land constituted Mewak in 1858 continues to be so forever. Uh, the ruling laid almost impossible almost to prove that in 1858 the particular plot of uh, the El Ukbi fulfilled all the conditions exempting him from being a wife, or that it was revived or formally allocated after that date. To show revivals, the claimants must prove that they continuously and effectively uh, cultivate the land in a manner that generates a permanent quality transformation. Uh, and uh, what we know is that the Ottoman and the British, there was a lot of ambiguity. Uh, in the Ottoman land code, uh, Mawat is land that is far from any inhabited place, but there is an ambiguity whether the distance must be measured only from what in the Ottoman land code is called village or town, or also from an inhabited place. And there, there is a big difference uh, between the two. Uh, the minim minimalist answer provided by the court only town and villages plays a crucial role in the construction of Bedouin as lacking property rights because uh, the, the, the statute has both the, the words village and town and inhabited place. Inhabited place can fit much better the definition of a Bedouin dwelling or uh, a, a company. So they chose this definition. Uh, and show that, for example, the renowned scholars and land court president Justice Duke determined that all inhabited place can form a measurement point, uh, so from which the land is mawat or not mawat. And in, uh, when it's mawat, essentially it's uh, defined as state land. Uh, uh, also, there was an ambiguity to the place from which the distance is measured have existed in 1858 which is the Israeli uh, definition, and we argued, therefore, for example, Tel Aviv is also Mawat, and every place in Israel is Mawat, because they did not exist in 1858. Or, uh, uh, and, uh, as, for example, Tudor, which is a important scholar, this is, uh, inhabited place may also include new localities and not those existing prior to law, therefore they're not Mawat, and therefore not, not state land, uh, for example, he said of late, the sites of many towns and villages have been, uh, been greatly extended and uh, the Mawat retreats when new settlements are built. Uh, what is a, rec a legitimate uh, settlement? The court adopted a limited Eurocentric standpoint of what would constitute a legitimate settlement. Uh, and really working very much with the evidence, but very selectively. And uh, the court recognized that uh, the tribe did roam in this area, and even used uh, the plots in certain periods for parking, grazing, and seasonal agriculture, but this is not enough to uh, uh, lift the burden of proof. Uh, and in that sense, I would say that it's even more sweeping than the Terra Nullius because in Terra Nullius they said they didn't do anything, they were just like animals or they had no connection to land. Now here there is a recognition, but uh, they are uh, denied any land rights, uh, which the special uh, uh, legal application is that if the village is recognized in the center, so all this area will not be Mawa, and the village can be recognized. But if, uh, according to the way it works, the land, the village itself is not recognized, all this land is a Mawa land, and therefore, by several movements, middle movement, it is effectively state land, and even 150 years later, it's still uh, state land. Um, and, uh, we can see that there was, I mean, we analyzed the distribution of uh, maps 
of uh, tense in, uh, and you can show it, I don't know not do it, clear pa uh, settlement patterns of uh, the Bedouin settlement. We have many uh, documents, for example, this is a report made by uh, the Palestinian non-development uh, company, which is a Jewish company, that wanted to, wanted to check the situation of the Negev, and uh, what they show is, it's from 1920, and Ahab Akabane, which is the El Abakib uh, tribe, had uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, houses, of uh, uh, horses, of uh, uh, territory, uh, and uh, as you see, they cultivated 30% of their land. And another, this is in Hebrew, again, they had 26,000 uh, dunums of land, which is quite substantial. And we found all this. We found it a bit after we could uh, introduce evidence. And we tried to uh, appeal to the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court to be able to show this evidence, which is based on Jewish research. The Supreme Court refused to allow a later uh, uh, submission. Uh, and uh, any claim, I will run quickly, uh, any claim that they had autonomy was rejected by the Supreme Court. Uh, I will, uh, uh, but we found that uh, uh, they had a lot of autonomy under Ottoman and British plan, a uh, British regime. They recognized their property. Uh, the uh, Ottoman bought land from uh, Ottoman authority bought land from the Bedouins, and as I said, the British registered land claim sold by Bedouin to Jews and to Arabs, non Bedouin Arabs. Um, this is, for example, a, a, a document uh, that shows that when the city of Beersheba was established by the Ottomans, they bought the land from a, a Bedouin tribe. So the state said, yeah, they bought it because so it's a kind of uh, uh, silencing ma uh, money, you know, everything you can say, but the, 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 they bought the land from the tribe. Uh, Churchill, who was the then Secretary of State for Colonies, uh, visited the area and reaffirmed the rights of the Bedouin, the special rights and customs of the tradition. So the Supreme Court says, well, who is, who is uh, Churchill? I mean, he's not a legislator, but uh, Churchill visited with the High Commissioner, and the High Commissioner in the mandate was also the legislative power, not only the uh, uh, head of the administrative power. Uh, and we saw, and I will end in two, three minutes. Uh, uh, so this is when, when the Jews wanted to buy land in the Negev, so the mandate wrote to uh, Ben Gurion and to Soret, who were heading the <coughs> Jewish uh, agency, the cultivable land in Beersheba subject is regarding as belonging to the Bedouin tribes by virtue of possession from time immemorial. Although government may able when land settlement takes place to claim certain areas as Mawat, in the past the land has been occupied entirely as tribal land, but in recent years the practice of allotting tribal homing has come into existence, thus enabling sales to be made to Jewish interest, arguing essentially that they cannot sell the land for Jewish settlement because it belongs to the Bedouin. Uh, we have many, many uh, documents of, well, this is a document of registration of uh, Bedouin land as non mawat land, but something called Mili. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of acquisition of land by Jews. Uh, this is a map of the settlement. Uh, based on land bought by Jews before 1948 from Bedouins. And uh, so essentially uh, uh, the court says, you know, we know very little of the situation of the Negev in the late Ottoman period. But say, because we don't know, you have to prove what happened. Okay, so this is uh, the position. And uh, I will end maybe in this document, uh, which is a document uh, that was the Minister of um, Justice established a select committee, a secret committee, headed by three very important uh, persons. Josef Weitz, who was uh, one of the key persons of the Jewish National Fund in land acquisition, and later the first head of the Jewish Land Authority. Uh, Benjamin Fishman was 
who was the head of the registration office in the Justice Department, and uh, Almon, who was the, the very, very powerful advisor on Arab affairs of the Prime Minister. And in uh, 1952, uh, his, the state uh, Justice Minister uh, nominated there as a committee. Uh, as you see, it's secret. And uh, a core committee for the question of ownership of Bedouin lands. Uh, they were nominated to clarify the question of ownership of Bedouin lands in the Negev. So uh, I will not read everything. Uh, it's in the book, so you know, most welcome to read it. Uh, we understand that for security needs, the Bedouin tribe that remained within Israeli borders were transferred from the regular dwelling place to a fixed area where they are situated until today. This area does not belong to them, and they do not claim and cannot claim any property rights in relationship. It's not exact, because some of the Bedouins in this area were original Bedouins, but many Bedouins were transferred from other areas. And then they continue and say, nevertheless, and you say, uh, the Bedouins saw all the land cultivated by them as land in their ownership, even though they did not have any land registration certificates. The authorities, both the Turkish and the British, recognized it as this fact, and they continue. We have two questions standing for us. Did the extensive cultivation of the negative land that the Bedouin cultivated throughout the limitation period, you know, the limitation to legal doctrine, bestow upon them a legal right to ownership? And B, do the Bedouin have the needed uh, evidence to prove cultivation of the above mentioned lands. And so the first question, the fact is known that during the mandate period, very considerable areas were registered in the Bedouin names on the basis of evidence that these lands were cultivated by them for the extent of the limitation period. And an important part of these lands was transferred after their registration to the Jewish National Fund, to other Jewish corporations, and to private Jews. So in these issues, there are hundreds of precedents. And we are of opinion that the government is that cannot and should not ignore it. Then, uh, we are of opinion that one should not avoid recognize the rights of the Bedouin ownership of those areas that they could uh, prove were under the cultivation of a long period, a limitation period. And that if the government is of opinion that for security reasons the Bedouin should be kept attached to those lands that they were allocated to them by the military authorities, one should avoid.